So recently I was crowned the world's greatest gamer in a tournament ran by Ludwig and presented by YouTube. There I showed my skill by playing through a bunch of different games and dominating at, well, most of them. It's a title I'm proud of and just because the tournament's done doesn't mean that I'm done proving that I deserve that title. And what better way to prove that than to take on some of the world's hardest challenges? And what better way to start than with Pokemon's premier difficult challenge, the Nuzlocke. Now I've never done a Nuzlocke before, so for my first crack at it, I decided I wanted to play Pokemon Soul Silver. Gen 2 is actually my favorite, but I never had a chance to actually play the remakes, so it was a perfect opportunity for me. I mash through the opening cutscenes, grab my starter, Void the Cyndaquil, let's go Void, and begin the challenge. So here's how a Nuzlocke works. First, you can only catch the first Pokemon you encounter in every route. That forces you not to play favorites and instead makes you figure out how to make it work with the team you end up getting. And second, if my Pokemon faint, they're dead. No coming back. Since I'm the world's greatest gamer, I decided to ramp up the difficulty just a little bit and say no healing items in battle either. Simple. I don't exactly consider myself a Pokemon master or anything, but I do have a bit of experience with it. Earlier this year, I got to play in a VGC creator tournament hosted by Pokemon world champion himself, Wolfie Glick, and I actually ended up winning. I had to learn a lot about Pokemon doubles on the fly, but it was really interesting and I had a good time, so I think I'll be good with a Nuzlocke. Is no running also in Nuzlocke? Will that be a thing? I don't know. Go hard or go home. Before I head to the first gym, I had to take on the Sages and Sprout Tower. By this point, I built up my first team. Joining Void the Cyndaquil, let's go Void, was Dave the Pidgey, Lil Thigh the Geodude, DeBuzz the Bellsprout, Batman the Zubat, and Rat Jam the Rattata. Not the scariest Pokemon squad, but it's okay, right? We're still pretty early. Surely the world's greatest gamer has nothing to worry about. I did not respect this food food. All of a sudden it had Lil Thigh down to 1 HP and I was forced to make the first big decision of the run. I decided to switch in Dave and try to get the jump on it, but I wasn't ready for the hypnosis read. So the Hoot Hoot put poor Dave to sleep and I was in serious trouble. Rat Jam could finish this fight with a quick attack, but I didn't have a way to get him in without risking another hypnosis. Unless... I made a sacrifice. Sorry to buzz. Rat Jam took care of business, but I wasn't expecting to say I'd lost a Pokemon before even setting foot in the first gym. Talk about a wake-up call. I ended up adding one more team member, Snack the Ekans, before heading to the first gym leader. Faulkner is a flying type trainer, which is why I was absolutely not about to let little Thigh go down in Sprout Tower. Geodude didn't learn a rock move yet, but it didn't matter. Against Faulkner's Pidgey, Geodude was more than enough to win out. And then, just in time for Faulkner's Ace Pidgeotto, it learned Rock Throw. Literally perfect timing. Now I thought Lil Thigh was gonna wrap up this fight when suddenly, <laughs> no! Rock Throw's only 90% accuracy and Lil Thigh already took a sand attack earlier in the fight from the Pidgey. Now I really didn't think I'd be worried about Gust of all moves, but here we are. I don't have anything else on my team that resists it. And not only do I need to reset Lil Thigh's accuracy, he's dead to a crit from the Pidgeotto, so we have to play safe. So I end up switching out to Snek, the newest member of the team, and I get a Leer off to lower the Pidgeotto's defenses. What's Snek? No, 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 I, I'm, I wanna be the hero. I wanna be the hero. I wanna save everybody. Now I think and I think, but I really can't find a way to pull this off. I tried my best, but Snek has to go down. Lil Thigh dodged the Gust crit but somehow Rock Throw didn't kill. I played it safe and switched in Void, who tanked the Tackle and the Gust before taking down the Pidgeotto with an Ember. Let's go Void. But I did end up losing another Pokemon, making it two deaths with just one badge. I'm gonna have to get significantly better if I wanna finish up this challenge. Up next, it's Bugsy. In between, I picked up a couple new team members, Charles the Magikarp and Babu the Hoppin. Charles wasn't gonna be useful for a while until he's a Gyarados, but you know he's gonna provide top tier commentary from the bench until he's ready. But you played phenomenal the entire weekend and you got to do it with your favorite character. <laughs> now looking at Bugsy, team, two of his Pokemon are completely useless. Now the ace, Scyther, is a little scary, but he can't take that many hits. Huh. Lead Scyther. That struck me as kind of weird, but hey, as long as I could swing back with a 4x effective rock throw. Oh, I understood Bugsy's plan now. Metapod still isn't a threat, and Lil Thigh took it out before it could get a lucky poison from Poison Sting. Now, he has to get out of there. It's time for Void to go to work. Let's go, Void. First Pokemon. 10? <gasps> this Scyther is a beast. Now, Void is definitely dead to another quick attack, 
and I've got to get him out of there. Sadly, we have to sacrifice Rat Jam, but even that's not enough to guarantee I can survive this fight. So I go to Dave, and he has one job. Pocket sand! Dave gets off three sand attacks before going down swinging, but I'm still not comfortable. I had to send in Batman to get off a supersonic as well, confusing the Scyther and forcing it to pass another roll just to swing. It paid off. Lil Thigh came in as Scyther hit itself, and then Rock Throw finally ended it, earning me my second badge. But man, I thought that Bug Gym was going to be so much easier, a place for me to kind of build the momentum that I wanted. Instead, I lost two more Pokemon in this gym, and I've lost four total. I've got to get it together, and quickly, because one of the most notorious gym fights in Pokemon history is coming up. Whitney and her legendary Miltank. First though, I've got to patch these holes Bugsy left in my team. I grab a new Dave, not Dave the second, just Dave 2, and then it's time to take on the rival. For the most part, the rival's team is still pretty weak at this point, but the Crocnaw looked like a little bit of a problem. Babu was my only grass type, and he didn't even have a grass type attack, but he did have synthesis. I thought to myself, it's time to stall this Croc out. After those gym battles, it was nice to have a fight go smoothly for once. I got to pick up a couple more encounters before Whitney. Gurren the Cock, Gurren the Kakuna, and Wellsy the Drowsy. These might not look like heavy hitters on the surface, but both have massive significance by the time this run is over. Against Bugsy, I learned the value of accuracy drops. No matter how many days we go through, we'll never forget you, buddy. I taught Flash to Gurren, knowing I might need to rely on that strategy against Whitney too. Now, I made it to Goldenrod City, but before I headed to Whitney's gym, I stopped at the game corner. I can technically take an encounter here if I want, but you can't name these Pokemon. One of the things I learned about Nuzlocke from my chat is you can kind of make up whatever rules you want. And I feel like naming a Pokemon makes them feel like my own friend. And I want all my Pokemon to be my friends, so I'm not going to take this encounter. However, there's still some good stuff I can buy with the coins here, like TMs and battle items. So I do what the world's greatest gamer was born to do. I game. And it becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly that as fun as Voltorb Flip is, getting anything useful is going to take a while. I can always come back to this later. I make a quick detour for the radio card and then it's on to fight Whitney. Whitney's Clefairy kind of got destroyed, but I knew it was all about the monster that was coming out next. The Mill Tank. Even though Void was somehow faster, I couldn't get much going other than a bunch of accuracy drops. It stomped did too much damage to me, and once I switched out, I had nobody to outspeed. It flinched me, it healed up, it hit rollout. Everything was going wrong. Once again, I had to fight my way out of a bad spot, and the one thing I was worried about happening, happened. I had to sacrifice Gurren just to get a flash off. Even that wasn't enough. But right before the fight, I taught Lil Thigh a move Nuzlockers never want to click. It's the break glass in case of emergency move of Nuzlocks. Self-destruct. This was an emergency. I didn't see any other way through, so I had to go boom. In the end though, I knew only losing two Pokemon to Whitney wasn't that bad. Whitney's Miltank is a legendary ender of runs, and I made it past her on my first try. Big shout out to Lil Thigh. Lil Thigh went above and beyond. So I've heard Whitney is pretty much the gatekeeper of the mid game, so I felt very reassured that I made it past her. I picked up Nidus the Nidoran and then headed to the National Park where I had to give up on a Scyther encounter because it was about to obliterate Void. I stuck around for a bit and decided to grind. See, a lot of people were telling me I should just use rare candies to level up to the gym leader's levels. Take the rare candy pill. I might play it like that when I do more Nuzlocke in the future, but for my first Nuzlocke, I really wanted to get the full experience. I wanted to have some challenge to the parts in between gym leaders. However, this meant that things like this could happen. See ya, Chuck. It's not a big deal for now, but I had big plans for Charles the Gyarados. I grinded for a bit more, caught Maxim the Sudowoodo, and then it was time for the next rival fight. Most of his team still wasn't threatening, but that Crocnaw? Definitely a problem. 
I had no choice but to sacrifice the horribly underleveled Babu. But this little guy pulled his weight. He survived the bite, got a huge tail whip off, and I knew if I brought in Void and hit him with a headbutt, things would be almost guaranteed. But would Void come in now, or did I want a little more chip damage with Nidus? I decided I wanted to make the hero play. I want to save everyone. Let's go Void. The scary faces definitely made things easier, but thanks to the defense drop, we were chilling anyway. Put up some salutes for Babu, the absolute legend. I had to get a little lucky around paralyzing confusion at the end of the fight, but I made the hero play and it worked. My graveyard is getting worryingly large though. Thankfully, I added two more Pokemon to the squad before moving on to Morty, the ghost gym leader. Says so the coughing and Rick the Santler. Now Rick's a particularly nice pickup here, a normal type just in time to deal with these ghosts. Whoops. Time to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> now I've been thinking about this Togepi egg sitting in my box forever because I was worried the game wasn't going to let me name it, but I desperately needed another normal type. I hatch it and I'm very happy to see I do get to name it. Welcome to the team, Mandy. Batman's bite seems like it should body Morty, whose entire team is weak to it. It took out the Haunter right away with a critical hit, but in came the Gengar who could totally knock it out with a crit shadow ball. Even though it's weaker, I'm also worried about the second Haunter in the back. With Curse and Mean Look, it can lock one of my Pokemon in and kill it slowly with passive damage. This means I need to be really careful about who's in when that Haunter enters the field. I think I'm gonna play it safe with the switch to Togepi. And it turns out they're actually even better suited for this fight than I realized. I mostly wanted it for its immunity to ghost attacks, which is why I liked it as the switch in here. I was worried after it got hit by Hypnosis, but I actually had nothing to fear. The only attack this Gengar had that could damage Mandy was Sucker Punch, and Mandy was carrying three different status moves in Sweet Kiss, Charm, and Yawn. All I had to do to stay safe from Sucker Punch, which only works when the target uses a damaging move, was click one of my three status moves until I woke up. Then Mandy got the Hacks Machine working overtime, confusing the Gengar with Sweet Kiss and putting it to sleep with Yawn. Togepi's one damaging move was perfect for this fight too, Extra Sensory a pretty strong psychic attack that hits Morty's full team of ghost poison types for super effective damage. It's a 3 hit KO on the Gengar, and Mandy managed to hold on until the mean look wore off and it could switch out. Void came in, but this mean look isn't going to help this Haunter. Void's not trapped in here with you, you're trapped in here with Void. Let's go Void. Now that I have 4 badges, the game opens up a bit, meaning it was time for some more encounters. First I grabbed Stickless the Magnemite. I wasn't that excited about this one at first, but the more I thought about it, the more valuable I realized it could be. Not only as an electric type attacker, but as a steel type defensive wall. Then I realized I was severely lagging in Dave's. So I grabbed this Poliwag, Dave3053. I finished up my fishing tour by scooping up a tentacle, Corn Dog Lover. Now, while I was taking care of all of this stuff, I also built up enough friendship to evolve Batmane into a Crobat. I've got a pretty big graveyard at this point, but I'm starting to like the way my team is shaping up. This upcoming section though, looked pretty tough. Not only do I have to win the gym fight against Chuck, I also have to be ready for the fight against Yusin, the guy who goes all super nerd over Suicune. Would really be nice to have a ground type for that electrode, but I'll worry about that after Chuck. Batman evolving into Crobat is going to be huge for this fight, giving it a huge speed boost and a decent attack boost. I also taught him Pluck for this fight. Not only is it a pretty good flying attack, super effective on Chuck's fighters by the way, but it also has a potentially sick secondary effect. If the enemy is holding a berry, Pluck steals it and lets Batman chomp down and heal from it. Now Chuck only has two Pokemon and they're both fighters, so I threw Batman out there and prepared to mash Pluck. A critical hit got me through the Primeape in two turns, even after Chuck healed it up, and I was feeling great. Plugging the Citrus Berry from the Polyrath even let Batman stay in an extra turn and hit it pretty hard. I'm not about to risk Batman to this Polyrath though, so now I have to switch. Time for the biggest brain switching of the run so far. Hopefully they click Hypnosis. <laughs> it was such a smart play, but Wellsy went on to take a crit and then missed the KO with Psybeam. Now this Polyrath was threatening a Focus Punch kill on just about my whole team. I look at the bench and realize Dave can switch in on anything else this Polyrath can throw out. I cross my fingers and do what we always do when the going gets rough. Throw some Pokemon named Dave in a danger. Paralyze him, Dave! Do it for all the other Daves in the world! Dave might have been a mere Poliwhirl up against Chuck's Polyrath, but it didn't matter. With Water Absorb, Dave ate up Polyrath's Surfs, 
found a body slam paralysis, and was able to whittle him down. The one time it clicked the focus punch that could have taken out Dave, it got fully paralyzed. World's greatest diff. Five badges down, I grabbed the Fly HM on the way out of the gym and headed to the Suicune cutscene. I was a little worried about using the Electrode, as I still didn't have a ground type, but Stickless was able to paralyze it with Thunder Wave. Shoutouts to old mechanics. And with its speed advantage destroyed, the Electrode went down pretty easy. Now Jasmine, All of Iron City's Steel Leader, was next. She has two Magnemites, and they both look like Void Fodder. The Steelix has Rock Throw, so I'd need another answer, but I decided I'd figure that out later. Void had no trouble dealing with the first Magnemite, but when Steelix came in instead of Magnemite 2, I suddenly felt like I was in trouble. Now I'm not that worried about the Steelix itself. I know Corndog can take care of it no problem. Corndog Surf did even more damage to the Steelix than I expected. A clean 2 hit KO after the Citrus Berry heal. But I still had no plan for the Magnemite. I decided to try a switch to Maxim and a super effective low kick. I figured a fighting move would be a good option here, but low kick is weight based, and Magnemite is one of the lightest Pokemon out there, so Sudowoodo was not the answer. We might lose one here, guys. I don't know how to get past this Thunderbolt. When in doubt, go to Dave. Works every time. You know, when I was planning this out, I really didn't think this was going to go this well. But the run's still chugging along, and if anything, these last two gyms have been the easiest yet. I think I'm starting to get the hang of this. I'm about to hit a ton of new encounters in these next few areas. Before taking on the final gym leaders, we have to take care of some story stuff first. I caught Fire, the Flaffy, and then headed off to the Lake of Rage. We got robbed of Charles the Gyarados back when I was grinding at the National Park. But here, at the Lake of Rage, I can fix my past mistakes. Welcome back, Charles. Now right about now, a bunch of people came into my chat ranting Species Claws, Species Claws, blah blah blah. Now first of all, I had no idea what a Species Claws even was before I booted up this run. Second of all, OG Charles would have still been alive if I played the way you guys wanted me to, because I never would have lost him to grinding. But most importantly, Nuzlocks are about having fun. And are you seriously going to tell me Chuck Nasty can't be a part of our fun? Exactly. But for now, he's going to be commentating from the box. I headed into the tower and polished off one of the easiest fights of the game. This double battle where you team up with Lance against a rocket executive and a grunt. He keeps flying! Is this battle losable? I freaked out for a second when I saw all these electrodes I had to fight to shut down the power and finish off this section, but it turned out none of them knew explosion, so I was worried for literally nothing. Off I went towards Price's Ice Gym and my 7th badge. After breezing through the ice puzzles, I'm the world's greatest gamer. Come on, it's time for the battle. You'd think Void would sweep an ice gym with ease, but Price's first two Pokemon are actually water types. And then his last Pokemon is a ground type, Piloswine, which can hit Void extremely hard with its mud bomb. The rest of the team has to carry here. Stickless took out Seal with a couple of electric attacks, but not before it was able to set Hail. Suddenly, I had a big realization about what's actually going on in this fight. Hail means Piloswine's Blizzard will always hit. Even if it's not a great special attacker, a 165 base power move is going to hurt no matter who it's coming from. I made a huge call on Piloswine's first turn, switching in my Crobat on a Mud Bomb, but this only bought me time. I knew it would Blizzard against Crobat, so I brought in Wellsy. I took a lot of damage, but I had a super effective Drain Punch to spam. No problem. <gasps> Holy shit! The hail didn't just activate Paloswine's no scope blizzards, it activated its ability, Snow Cloak, which grants it a 25% chance to avoid attacks in hail. It kicked in at a horrible time for me, and now my back was against the wall. At least the hail stopped, but I'm not sure if Drain Punch heals enough to keep me alive through an Ice Fang or a Blizzard. But Blizzard doesn't have 100 act, yeah, but he goes for Ice Fang. I felt confident Piloswine wouldn't mud bomb on my switch, so I brought in Tentacruel. A huge surf was enough to kill, and the Dugong wasn't anything of a threat. Despite that terrifying miss, the fight was deathless. Just one more badge to go. Now, before I can take on Claire, Team Rocket's doing Team Rocket things at the radio tower back in Goldenrod. This looks like it's going to be just a bunch of coffins. What could possibly go wrong? <gasps> Goodbye, Wellsy. I just saw a bajillion coughings. I didn't think they were problematic. I also missed that Wellsy got hit with a smokescreen earlier in the battle. That one really hurts. 
I had gone through three whole gyms without losing a singular Pokemon, and this is what gets me? No time to be salty though, because I was just about to walk right into a rival fight. Now, the rival's Croconaw had grown up into a Feraligator, but the last time I fought him, I didn't have Stickless. That Feraligator is exactly why I played it safe at the start of this fight. Maxim had a rough time in this one, dealing with critical hits and confusion misses. Batman picked up the slack though, and was able to win the Battle of the Bats. The rival sent in his Magnemite, which void hard counters. Or so I thought. The void switch will be pretty solid as long as I don't get paralyzed. We have issues. This could have spiraled out of control immediately, but Void managed to connect the Lava Plume through Paralysis on the first try. Let's go, Void. In comes the Feraligator, for which I've been saving the Magneton. Easy switch in, right? He's gonna click Water Gun, right? I've learned from my earlier mistakes now, and I decided to play it safe. I switched in Corn Dog instead, let it tank a Thrash, and then sent in Magneton to take down the Feraligator with zero risk. Jude Wiley, the Girafferig, a recent addition, got in on the fun for the first time here. I was worried that I had screwed up by bringing it in against the rival's haunter's Confuse Ray, but Jude was holding a Persian Berry when I caught him. Get unintentionally mixed, Silver. The switches in this fight were amazing all the way until the end. The rest of the Radio Tower fights against the Rockets were pretty easy all the way up until Executive Archer, the leader of the Rockets in this game. The Hound Doer was easy pickings for Corn Dog, but the Hound Doom? I wasn't ready for a feint attack to do that much. A crit would have killed. I went to Crobat. Leaning on its speed. I'm gonna do 45, watch. Oh, it did 56. <laughs> Alright, we're plucking. <gasps> I think I might be dead. Oh, you don't heal? Oh. Oh, this is awesome. The Houndoom was by far the toughest Pokemon Archer had. Magneton easily handled the last coughing of the tower. The Rockets disbanded, and everybody was happy. Except for Team Rocket. I picked up a huge encounter before I headed off to Claire's Gym in Blackthorn City. Riza the Swineup. Unlike the OG Silver I'm used to, in Soul Silver, Piloswine can evolve into Mammal Swine, boosting most of its stats, especially attack. That makes it a perfect addition to my team for Claire's Dragons, even if her ace, Kingdra, takes neutral damage from ice thanks to its water typing. The other water type on her team, Gyarados, was easy pickings for fire, but evolved into an Ampharos and was ready to delete it with a discharge. When the Dragonair came out though, things got complicated. Oh! 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 The easy choice here was to sacrifice Ampharos for the free switch and the momentum that would give. I'm not trying to play like that though. I'm still trying to be the hero. Instead, I hard tagged in Riza, who barely managed to tank the combination of Dragon Pulse and Aqua Tail over the next two turns. Even with healing, Dragonair couldn't escape Riza's Ice Shards. But once again, the Ace came out early. I tried Corn Dog, but he couldn't land a poison before a couple of Dragon Pulses took him down to just 5 HP. So much for the hero plays. I had to sacrifice fire in the end, giving me a chance to get Stickless out on the field, if it could just survive a Hydro Pump. He's so fast. Holy shit, we're dead. DGs, I don't agree yet. I don't agree yet. I looked over my options, and they're all bad. I decided to go with the get out of jail free card that saved us in the early game. Accuracy drops. I go to Void with the plan of clicking smoke screen. Void's not dying. He's never died. Watch. The run's over. Void's dead. With Void dead, Batman had to come in. Bite and cross poison offer out, as does the hydro pump miss on the first turn. And then. It just hyper beamed. <gasps> We're gaming! I think we just go for the crit. Batman didn't get it, but it didn't matter. Kingdra went down anyway, but there was still the final Dragonair to deal with, and Ice Shard would only do about 70%. So what's the play? Sack Bat? Sack Corn Dog? I decide there's no other choice and throw Corn Dog to the Wolves. But it turned out Corn Dog had something to say about all of that. Corn dog! Poison! Poison corn dog crit! Poison! Poison crit! Crit infinite damage! Oh my god! Oh! 
Dude, we survived? We lost some good mods, but we survived? Yeah, that was by far the scariest fight of the run. The first time I even felt threatened since all the way back at Whitney's gym. The losses were bad in this one though. Obviously, losing Void hurt. Let's go Void. But I was even sadder to lose Stickless. Steel Electric is a ridiculously strong defensive type, and I think he was going to be really helpful for the Elite Four. The most important thing though, the run is alive. I wasn't sure if I would make it past this part, dude. Up to Gen 4 or Gym 4 was pretty hard, but I think Gym 7 to 8 is the hardest batch of the game. With all eight badges, Johto is wide open to me. Before I head to Victory Road, it's time for the Encounter Roundup montage. A lot of these pickups weren't too exciting, but I feel like I found a couple gems here. After losing Stickless, Lantern is the answer I desperately needed for Lance's Gyarados. Skarmory is an awesome defensive tank. I also saw potential for Quagsire and Steelix, depending on how things work out by the time I actually get to the Pokemon League. I tried to head over there, but I forgot about the Kimono Girls. I have to take out all of their evolutions before I'll be allowed to head to Victory Road. No problem, right? Do you do 42 naturally? Oh my god. Turns out, this Espeon hits hard. I go to Skarmory for the resistance and some beefiness, but it's still nearly a two-hit KO. I had no choice but to sacrifice the lantern I just got. That gave me enough momentum, and the combination of Quagsire and Mamoswine was enough to wall out the rest of the team. But what a terrible loss to take on a fight I didn't even know was required. All right, we gotta dig into our reserves. Our reserves suck. I just don't see an answer for Gyarados in my box. There's a TM for Thunderbolt in the game corner, but it costs 10,000 coins. And I wasn't even 15% of the way there after about an hour of grinding. I was willing to grind a little bit in this run, but come on. I knew people were going to whine about Species Claws, but the way forward was clear. Chuck Nasty, get in there. And if Chuck's going to take down the top Dragon Trainer, we've got to first take down the God of Raging Waters, Lugia. I grabbed Blakers the Krabby along the way. I could have added Lugia to the team here as well, but I decided I could finish this without the help of a Legendary. At this point, I feel pretty locked into this team of six. I encountered an Ursaring on Victory Road, but decided it wasn't worth the trouble. Soon, it was time for my last battle with Silver. Mamoswine is great into just about this whole team, as only the Feraligator is much of a threat. Bambo and Batman combined to take out the Feraligator, and from there, Reason was just too much for Silver to handle. I finally switched against the Golbat just to be safe, and after hitting myself in confusion an annoying number of times, Silver went down for good. As I approach the Pokemon League, I make one last bit of preparation. I bought a wide lens in the hope that Chuck will actually be able to hit Thunders against what I think is the strongest opponent out of the whole five fight gauntlet in front of me, Lance's Gyarados. It turns out though, I may have been overlooking the scariest fight of them all. Riza got us off to a great start with a couple of Ice Shards. In came Slowbro. I went to my Quagsire to cover water type attacks and pressure with Yawn, but this is where this Slowbro can cause trouble. If you can't kill it quickly, it can use this combination of Amnesia and Curse to boost its defenses to absurd levels. Without Stickless and Elusive, my electric types, this fight got way harder. I really didn't have any good ways to stop it from boosting up, even if I put it to sleep. I used those sleep turns to fish for Sludge Bomb poisons, and finally, I had a way out. Skarmory was able to wall until the poison chipped Slowbro to death, but Slowbro was still able to make my life tough on the way out, confusing Skarmory with a water pulse and making me feel pressure to switch against Jinx. Steel Wing would have been great here, but instead, I gave Jinx the chance to lovely kiss Mamoswine. This is a bad spot. And it looked even worse after Jinx's Psychic dealt massive damage to Riza. I have to keep pivoting. I'm trying to preserve Chuck's life because he's necessary for Lance, but he had to come in here and get off a waterfall before retreating for Skarmory. Even that tank was on its last legs though, and it looked like there was no way I'd get through this fight without a death. Alright, I'll see you, Tenta. Cordon's faster! What do we do about this? Dude! Sag. Talk about an unlikely MVP. 
Corndog did so much for this run. What an absolute legend. He sadly couldn't survive this fight, but he did more than his job. But this fight isn't over. I don't just have to survive. I have to make sure Riza and Chuck stay healthy here too. There's no way I get through Lance without either of them. I made the difficult decision to sacrifice Batman. He's been with us practically since the original team. Would his sacrifice be in vain? Can Riza wake up? Can Riza survive the second Zati's psychic? Oh, Jesus. All right, we beat one Elite Four member. What an insane fight. Despite all the hacks, despite the terrible spot I was in against the Jinx, I managed to save the four most important team members for the rest of the game. That means the rest of the Elite Four is going to be a 4v6 at best. But Chuck is about to go insane. So here's my thought process. Here's my thought process. If we fight Lance, yawn with Quagsire, live, whatever the move is, switch over to Chuck Nasty, dance, 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 and then mash Waterfall. And then uh, we'll also have Wide Lens to make Ice Fang 100 accuracy. And if that doesn't work, Ice Shard Mammal Swine in the back. And if that Gyarados Ice Fangs me and it freezes my Gyarados, I am going to turn off the stream. Still, there's three trainers left before Lance. Koga has a poison team though, and that means Skarmory is just about untouchable. If I can switch smartly around Justice, four Pokemon should be enough. There it is. Oh, we get to see who's faster too. Okay, Venomoth is faster. And dead. It is faster and dead. Ariados is back. Okay. You've been counting on this one? You do no damage to me. You actually do nothing to me, you muck. Oh no, Screech! What? Oh, you have lefties? Oh, this actually might be problematic. I am a cheeser? No, I am a winner. Four! Let's go, Chuck. Finally, I get to rest my brain, because Bruno is the easiest fight to plan and execute of this entire gauntlet. Gyarados' flying type resists fighting, and the only electric type move on his whole team is Hitmonchan's Thunder Punch. The plan is simple. Put something to sleep with Bambo, and then let Chuck dance on him. Two, three, four, five, six. All right, we win. Okay, okay. Riza's ice moves are great against Lance's Dragonites, of course, but Karen's team is actually the big reason I needed to keep him around. I needed this damage to deal with Karen's Umbreon, which dropped to a critical hit earthquake. I was a little bit scared of one thing. I didn't want to see the Houndoom next. Maybe Houndoom is next? If Houndoom is next, we have a problem. It's Flamethrower for sure. Houndoom outspeeds for sure. If my calculations were right, there's only a 1 in 8 chance of surviving. But if Riza could just swing, I'd win the fight right here. I decided to stay in. Watch this. Obviously, I would have loved to get lucky and save Riza there. Even though Riza wasn't around for long, he really did clutch up. But I wouldn't have made that choice if I didn't think the rest of the squad could handle things from here. Never let anybody tell you I didn't believe in Chuck Nasty. Alright, this waterfall is going to make Houndoom explode. It's gonna die. All right. I'm really proud of how I played my first ever Nuzlocke Delete 4. Koga and Bruno were painless, but Karen made me think, and Will pushed me to the absolute limit. I had to make a couple of sacrifices, but I stuck to a plan that would keep the most important team members alive for the final fight. I have Bamble the Quagsire, ready to yawn Lance's Gyarados. And of course, there's the star of the show, Chuck Nasty. 
There's basically only one thing I have to worry about, and that's an Ice Fang freeze from Lance's Gyarados. If Chuck can stay thawed out, he should be able to dance his way to victory. I was never afraid. I was never afraid. Oh my goodness. Four is GG's, and this Gyarados isn't that scary, especially if he starts clicking Dragon Pulse on me. It does 22. Three. Is plus three enough? Oh god, another one. <laughs> We're going six. If we get the flinch again, we'll go six. Ooh, a critical. Ooh. Yeah, if we get the flinch again, we'll go six. And I'm currently using two moves that can flinch. So, there's pretty high odds that we get another flinch. Even if it wasn't super, I think this just kills on neutral. The first one. When the last mon is going to be Zard. Oh, thank you for your services and thank you for your services. Oh, mm. are you banning Dragon Dance? Ah, oh, maybe. Dragon Dance is pretty good. But with that, I completed my first ever Nuzlocke. Thanks to Chuck Nasty. And chat. Thank you, Chuck. We bent the rules to use you a little bit, but you ended up carrying us in the end. Bambo, you joined the squad a little late, but you did your job the best. And Justice, the Elite Four Specialist, came in at the end and did your job perfectly. Look at them. Look at them.